I've ministered with a man uh, several times who is from a predominantly Muslim country. He had built uh, several churches, pioneered several churches, several hundred churches there. And he had also built several Bible colleges. And the Muslims were getting madder and madder and madder at him. And they kept telling him they were going to kill him if they could get him. But when they get him, they're going to kill him. And this just kept uh, escalating and escalating until one weekend where they were having a pastor's conference and they it was it was widely publicized so they they were pretty sure he was probably going to be there with several hundred pastors that are underneath him and it was him and his wife and his two daughters and they went back to where they were staying that night and the the muslim uh, group surrounded the house and and you know they got machetes and machine guns and they told him come out um, or we're going to come in and him and his wife and his daughters gathered in a circle in the room and they the daughters he said were crying uh, because the, the men outside said, we're going to, tonight's the night, we're killing you tonight, and there's nothing that's going to save you. And so the daughters were crying, and they're all huddled up. And as they're crying, uh, the, the girls are crying, and the dad's trying to comfort them, and he's saying, you know, even if we die tonight, we're going to go to heaven, and it's going to be okay. And, and But God is faithful, right there. We have a faithful God. And so he's telling them this, and they're, they're still crying, and then they stormed the house, and they came in. And he said that they were literally uh, bumping into them, walking around him, but they became completely invisible. Him, his wife, his two daughters became completely invisible. He said it was as if the Lord silenced his daughters. They quit crying. And the, the people that tried to come in to kill them stayed in their house for hours, several hours that night. And they were just completely invisible to them because God did a miracle, just like he did in the Bible with Peter when Peter was brought out of the jail by the angel. We serve a faithful God. Despite circumstances, despite what's going on around us, we serve a faithful God. And you could look that man up. His name is Joshua Cheggy. There's a lot more to that story. He ended up coming to the United States. God sent him here to be a missionary here. But um, Psalm 91 says this, starting at verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord... He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of destruction that lays waste at noonday. We see here it is... Uh, kind of an if-then statement, starting with verse 1 being the if. And we look at it, and verse 1 tells us that the person who dwells, depending on what version you read, dwells, abides, speaking of staying in God's presence. This is someone who is chosen in their heart to make a daily choice, a daily decision to stay in God's presence. And if that person does that, then verse 2, God is a refuge. He's a fortress. Then he's the one we can trust, also verse 2. Then he's the one who saves us from evil people and evil things like disease, verse 3. He covers and protects us like a baby bird, verse 4. We don't have to fear danger, verse 5. Now, does it say anywhere in there that God promises to remove the danger? No, it doesn't say that at all. In fact, listen to this statement. Let it soak into you. And I know uh, just by the fact that you're here tonight, you believe this. And we've got to share this truth. We've got to share this message with the, the rest of the world that doesn't believe this. But this statement, just, just contemplate this. True safety is not found in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. I'm going to say that one more time, and I'd just like you to close your eyes right where you're sitting. Let this soak into your soul. Let it soak into your spirit. Contemplate this. True safety is not found in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. Just like Joshua Cheggy found out, uh, the danger wasn't removed, but God was there with him. Just like Daniel and the lion's den, the lions weren't destroyed, they weren't killed, but God quenched their mouth, held their mouth shut. The danger was still there, but God kept him safe. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego found out, they were thrown in the fire. The fire was so hot that it killed the, the soldiers that threw them in. But yet they came out and they didn't even smell like smoke. That's prophetic for New Testament believers today. 
that we don't have to get stained by what the world gets stained by. We don't have to get affected by what the world gets affected by. But the truth is this. True safety is not found in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. And the same God of the Bible, he says, I, the Lord your God, do not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he did it for people then, he does it for people today. Amen? If we go back to Psalm 91, we read verses 5 and 6. Again, it says, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence. Now, uh, some versions are going to say sickness or disease that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Another statement to contemplate, another statement that we need to get down so deep. True healing, true healing is not found in the absence of sickness, but in the presence of God. And I'm going to repeat that again. And maybe, you know, you could be here tonight and you might deal, be dealing with some kind of physical ailment in your body tonight. It could be a horrible prognosis from a doctor. It could be a loved one, a spouse, a child. It could be a friend that you know that's dealing with something, uh, you know, the cancer word, uh, all the bad things that could be happening. Hear this. True healing is not found in the absence of sickness, but in the presence of God. Think about it. Every single person that we read about in the Bible, 35 recorded miracles of Jesus in the New Testament, 18 of those were healings. Of those 18 healings, every single one of those people, uh, whether it was a blind eye or a deaf ear or it was a lame person, doesn't matter what it was, every one of those people died at some point and that healing came to naught. I've counted from beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Eight different times people were raised from the dead other than Jesus. Jesus is the ninth one in the Bible, but eight people in the Bible raised from the dead and I can't see too well out there, but just a raise of hands. Has anybody here ever met one of those eight people from the Bible that raised from the dead? No, because they all died again, right? Every single one of the people that were raised from the dead in the Bible all died again. Uh, in 2006, as some of you know from the last conference and I shared there, uh, I had an accident. I owned a business uh, where I did on-site diesel repair and a large Peterbilt logging truck fell on top of my body. The whole front of this, this entire weight of the front of this truck fell across the middle of my body. I was guillotined literally in half to about one inch thick here, about two inches thick here, flat all the way across the middle, thinner than my spine. Five major places, arteries were severed. I bled out and I was dead several minutes. I was prayed back to life three times at the scene of the accident by a, a stranger, a Christian woman I'd never met. Three times she prayed me back to life. But guess what? Just like the eight people in the Bible that were raised from the dead, someday I'm going to die again. And the biggest miracle we see is not even if, if someone is raised from the dead or if someone's healed from cancer or if someone uh, gets out of the wheelchair or whatever the, whatever the uh, illness or whatever the sickness or whatever the problem is. The biggest miracle, that even if someone is raised from the dead, the biggest miracle we're going to see isn't going to be something that's temporary like that. The biggest miracle is when someone has Jesus in their heart, when someone is truly dwelling, like it says in verse 1, abiding, staying in God's presence, having intimacy, having relationship with God so that they can have that eternal relationship. And the Bible is clear that eternal salvation doesn't start when we die and go to heaven. Eternal salvation starts the moment you receive Jesus in your heart as Lord and Savior. And then he, we're in a covenant with him, a relationship that's a covenant of his goodness and his mercy and his grace. And when we're in that covenant, then he says, I'm going to be the one that's your refuge. I'm going to be your fortress. I'm going to be the one you can trust. I'm going to be the one that saves you. I'm going to be the one that covers and protects you. I'm going to be the one that makes sure that you don't have to fear danger, sickness, illness, or disease. Because he promises to never leave us. He promises to never forsake us. The night of the accident... Uh, it happened for us. Um, I was working underneath this truck. There was another uh, technician in the, on the, at this place, and he had jacked up the truck and not used the proper safety equipment. I was just getting ready to leave. I had finished the job that I was called. Just like you'd call a plumber to your house to work on your plumbing, people called me to do on-site repairs. So one day I might be working on a, a generator on the roof of a hospital. 
or the next day I might be working at a construction site on a large piece of construction equipment, any place where diesel engines were that somebody couldn't easily bring them to a shop and you had to go out and do on-site repair. That's what I specialized in. I traveled around the state of Wisconsin doing that and in November of 2006, I was an hour from our home working on this logging truck. The man had jacked it up and uh, removed one of the wheels. I'm just getting ready to leave because I'd finished working on the engine and then he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, could you just look at one more thing before you go? I remember looking up at the clock, it was 6, 10 p.m. I'd left my house that morning at 6 a.m. I drove an hour to get there, it was already at that point. You know, I'm already in a long day and I've got an hour drive home. And the guy said, you don't have to fix it. He said, I just want you to diagnose the problem, maybe order the parts, come back later, whatever. And so I, I went underneath this truck I saw that it was not uh, proper, properly um, secured. I saw that it was jacked up, but there were no safety uh, jacks or safety blocks underneath it. So I, it was my choice. I went underneath it to look at the bottom of the engine. And when I did, the engine was still running. I yelled out to the man, Leonard, the other mechanic who worked at this logging company. And I said, you know what? I don't need it running, shut it off. He climbed up inside the truck to shut it off. When it did, the truck shifted. And when the truck shifted, he had, he had grabbed the steering wheel to pull himself up in because he has a wooden leg. And when he did that, uh, the wheel that was still on the ground on the driver's side as I'm laying underneath this axle, and the axle was just maybe an inch above me. The axle is about this wide, about that tall, and there's five to six tons of weight, 10 to 12,000 pounds of weight on the axle itself. And I'm laying underneath it, and when he got in there, the jack slipped out, and this truck just crashed to the middle of my body. I ended up thinner than my spine. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, all the, the radiology reports say that my L4, L5 vertebrae were both broken. It says that they were, those two vertebrae were spider cracked and slightly D-shaped. So it crushed my body down to where those two, my, I was thinner, just a little bit thinner than my spine, if you can imagine that. And even thinner on the left side because that's the side that the, the wheel was off of. So everything in the middle, spleen, pancreas, intestines, um, stomach, kidneys, everything that's between the bottom of your ribs and the top of your pelvic was completely crushed, including uh, major arteries and veins. And so I, I can't tell you how bad it hurt. The pain was off the charts, but I, when the truck fell on me, when it fell through the middle of my body, and, and I, I apologize, I know we just got done eating, but literally when it fell through me, blood came out from the inside of my mouth, shot out of my mouth and landed in a blob on the cement next to my head. And I remember seeing that in that split second, realizing what happened and calling out and saying, Lord, help me. I said it a second time in case he didn't hear me the first time. Lord Jesus, help me. And then I looked down and that's when I saw there was only about that much space, a little, maybe an inch or just a little more, between the bottom of the axle and the cement. So I know my whole body, from the bottom of my ribs to my pelvic was that thick and just a little bit more thicker on this side. And so uh, again, the pain was off the charts. The man got out of the truck, got down and he went into shock when he saw me. When he saw my body crushed like that, he went into shock and he froze. And I'm looking back at him, and the, the, if you can picture the big chrome bumper back here behind my head, me just underneath this truck. I'm looking back at him, and uh, he's staring at me with this look of horror on his face, but he's not doing anything. And I started, my diaphragm was pushed up into my uh, lungs, so my lungs were partially clapped. And I was having a hard time breathing. I was really having a hard time talking, but I was able to keep begging him and saying, Leonard, call 911. Please call 911. And he wouldn't, he was, he was in shock. He just froze. And he's looking at me and I'm looking at him. I just kept, it seemed like forever. I was begging him to call 911 before he shook out of it. He got up, he, he got on the phone and he called 911. Now, as you can imagine, uh, it's in the middle of nowhere. Like it's a, the volunteer fire department was probably a half an hour away. I mean, we're in the middle of absolutely nowhere where you'd expect the logging business to be. And so um, he, he got off the phone, he went and got the jack. He couldn't put the jack back underneath the axle to jack it up off my body because the jack was, the, the axle was now on the cement. So he put it on another part of the suspension in the front leaf spring, which is curved. And you don't want to jack something up that's on a curve because the jack is just going to slip. And so I'm watching him do it to my left-hand side. And I was begging him, saying, no, don't jack it up there. It's just going to slip and fall on me again. And he was telling me, it's the only place I have. I don't have any. There's no other place that I can put the jack underneath. So he was jacking it up, and it, it, was, it was moving. And finally, it caught on just a little edge of a piece of metal. And then it, he was able to jack the truck up off my body. 
And so as soon as he did, I was able to see my whole body now. And before that, I could only see my ribs up because the, the axle is probably that deep. So when it fell through my body, all I could see was from my ribs up. And when he got it off of me, and now I can see my whole body again. If you can just imagine this, my work uniform went to the edge of my ribs, went straight back, followed along my spine, and came back up at my pelvic. And when I saw that flat spot across the middle, uh, it was terrifying because in my mind I thought, there's no way that anybody should be able to be alive and look like that. And the, the thought that followed it was, there's no way I'm going to live. This is it. I'm dead. There's no way I'm going to live. And I was begging him to get me off front of the truck because I was afraid it was going to fall again because the jack was in a bad spot. And I, it hurt so bad already. I did not want the truck to fall on me again. And so I just was begging him to get me off from the truck. He was terrified. He wouldn't touch me. Uh, most people have been told you don't want to move somebody with a back injury. And so he wouldn't. He said, you know, I've called the, the 911. They're coming. He said, I'm not going to touch you. So I reached back, and just behind my head was the bottom of that chrome bumper. I was able to grab the bottom of it. I dragged myself out. The, the, the creeper is broken in the middle, if you can picture, a little tool that mechanics use to go into the vehicles. The creeper is crushed flat. And I dragged myself out this far, so maybe just this much of me is sticking out from the front of the bumper of the truck, the, in the very front. And I put my hands on the bumper due to another push because that axle was still going across my legs. And if the jack would slip again, now it's going to fall on my legs. And so I, I wanted to get completely away from that. The, the part that had fallen on me, the lowest part of the truck. And so when I put my hands on the bumper to, to do one more push, my body began to shake so severely. My body was going to shock as well, obviously. But for whatever reason, I fixated on this right bicep. And my body was shaking so bad. And for whatever reason, I was watching my arm shake, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't push anymore. I couldn't do that last, that last push to get my, myself out. And what I didn't know was, because of the places that the arteries were severed, as soon as he jacked it up off of me, I was immediately bleeding out. I mean, quick. I was just bleeding out, and it just felt like, uh, I mean, the pain was incredible, but as soon as he jacked it up off of me, this, um, this overwhelming weakness is, is probably the best way I can describe it. This overwhelming weakness came over me, and I didn't know why at the time, but the doctors told me later it was because I was pumping all my blood out into my abdo abdominal cavity. It's all just leaking out, and so that's where the weakness came from. And so uh, I'm, I'm out now this far, and um, again, I'm having a hard time getting my breaths, and I'm realizing that my breaths are getting further and further apart. And I'm thinking to myself, this is it. One of these times, it's going to be the last breath, and I'm fighting for every breath, and it's, it's, it was a struggle to get each breath. And I could hear my heart, because when something about the human body, when you go into shock, and your, your pulse, your rate is just pounding away, right? So my heart is just pounding in my ear just like if you were jogging and this is what my heart did and I heard my heart stop and I was trying to take that last breath and I couldn't get the last breath and when my heart stopped my spirit left my body and went up to the roof of the garage the Bible is very clear every person has a spirit that lives inside of their body it, it doesn't matter young old doesn't matter what color you are it doesn't it is, irregardless of, of any of that stuff, each human being has a spirit that lives inside your body. It says in the Bible, when Jesus died on the cross, that he gave up his spirit. At the point that his physical body died on the cross, he gave up his spirit, and his spirit left his body. My spirit left my body. I went up the roof of the garage. It's the reason why right now, depending on which study you read, 8 to 10 million people in the world out of 7.5 billion people, which is approximately 3%, of the world's population at this point today in time have had a near-death NDE, near-death experience or out-of-body experience at the point of death from, you know, it doesn't matter, stroke, drowning, heart attack, drug overdose, uh, accident, trauma of some type, whatever. And their spirit leaves their body, but somebody comes and does CPR on them or somebody puts the defibrillators on them and zaps them back to life and their spirit comes back in, whatever. My spirit leaves my body and I went up the roof of the garage. We as Christians, if you're here tonight and you're a Christian, which I'm guessing most of us are probably, if you're here as a Christian and maybe you've lost a loved one who you know had a relationship with Jesus, don't you dare feel bad for them. Every Christian funeral should be a celebration. I do not have words to tell you how amazingly awesome it felt to be out of this body of death that the Bible talks about. When my spirit left my body and I went up to the roof of the garage, I was in, the, the word 
peace, that shalom, shalom that it talks about, that perfect peace, uh, it was peace times a million. It was when the Bible talks about peace that doesn't make sense, peace that surpasses our mental understanding, that's the kind of peace. It was peace times a million up in the ceiling. I was literally having a party. I felt the best I've ever felt. There's nothing and nothing that's even come close in my life to feeling that good. Nothing. I was up there just having this amazing time all by myself in the ceiling. Watching out at the accident scene. I could see the truck. I could see, uh, you know, this guy's body down there. I could see the emergency workers now and everybody's walking around. I'm listening to every word they're saying. They're saying that guy's dead and there's nothing they can do. I've got this massive chest injury, so they're not gonna do CPR. I've, they know I have, a, I've obviously, because of the way I'm crushed, I've bled out, so they didn't even bother to do defibrillator, nothing, they just stood back. They're all just standing around talking and saying he's dead. And the guy that I've been working with, I'd known for a long time, he's crying, he's on his knees, and because he had jacked it up and not used the safety equipment, he's feeling bad, he's apologizing to me. I'm listening to everything up there. I didn't even know that that poor slob underneath the truck that was crushed was me. I mean, I, that, maybe that's part of the reason why I felt so good and didn't feel bad about the situation. So I'm just watching from above. I'm listening to every word, and he, I could hear him saying clearly things like this. So he's on his knees. If you can picture this, here's the front of the truck. Here's the big chrome bumper, just this much me from, out, out from underneath the front of the bumper. And he's on his knees, and he's got his hands, he's running them through my hair, and he's apologizing, and he's saying, I should be the one that's dead, not you. I'm so sorry. I'm such an old fool. I should be the one that's dead, not, not you. I'm so sorry. And he's just saying it over and over. And I, and I didn't feel bad. It wasn't, ladies, it wasn't like watching a Hallmark movie. There was no tears. There was no chick flick kind of crying or nothing like that. I mean, it, I was having a good old time in the ceiling just watching, listening. I mean, listening to everything. And I didn't feel bad about anything. And on each side of that guy down there, who I didn't know at that point was me, on each side of his body was a huge angel. On each side of Leonard, the other mechanic who was on his knees. Leonard's like six foot one, six foot two. And he's, and he's running his fingers through my hair, and on each side of him, on their knees, just like him, were angels, but their heads were about this much taller, approximately. So I know, based off of Leonard, that those angels were approximately eight feet tall. They had broad shoulders, like this, big broad shoulders. They had long hair that went down to where the belt was on their robes. They had white shining robes. Angels are mentioned 290 sometimes in the Bible, and sometimes it mentions their white shining clothing. I saw it. It was like a uh, cheap, cheesy uh, Tide commercial. I mean, their, their robes were emanating white light. I mean, they were glowing white robes. They never spoke. They never turned around and looked at me. I'm up in the ceiling. I'm looking down at their backs. And the one on the driver's side, shoulder to shoulder with Leonard, he's reached over, and he's got his hands in the middle of this flat spot in my body. The one on the passenger side, shoulder to shoulder with Leonard, reached over, hands in the middle. So they're, they're reached across. They're touching me in the middle right here. And I, I see it, and I go, oh, look, those angels, angels are down there to help that guy. Isn't that nice? I was just all happy about watching it all happen, and I'm just watching from above. And I'm listening to the conversations, and uh, the first guy on scene, I mean, this is a very, very rural area, and the first guy on scene had saw my body, how bad it was crushed. And, I, and because of the extent of the injuries, he knew that there was going to be no local little hospital that's going to be able to do anything for me. So he was wise in the fact that they called MedFlight from our state's uh, largest trauma center, the Madison Trauma Center. And uh, he did that, but unfortunately, uh, they forgot to call an ambulance because somehow you got to get the body from the scene of the accident out to wherever the helicopter lands. And so I'm listening for, to everything from above. Several minutes goes by, and I'm, and I'm listening in the back corner is, is the chief and the assistant chief, and they're talking about a lawsuit. And they're saying, oh, we're going to get sued for this. Because once they realize that the helicopter is coming, but they've got no way to, to get uh, my body from the scene of the accident out to the helicopter, the helicopter went back to Madison. Then they called an ambulance that came from a town half an hour away. It came, and they ended up, it, it comes. So... I'm, I'm listening to everything above, watching, and this woman comes in the back door. Now, here, it's just a little detail, but think of this. Dead body, no heartbeat, no pulse for several minutes underneath the truck. And a year later, when I went and spoke at the volunteer fire department to tell them thank you, I was able to go around the room out of 30 people and point out eight of the 10 people who had come to the scene of the accident because at that time, I still had a very clear snapshot from above of the people that were standing around talking. So I go around the room of 30 a year later and said, you were there, you were there, you were there. And I asked the red-haired lady, and, this, and it was easy because she was the only, uh, the only gal there, and this older guy who had come in the back door, and I said, why did you guys come in the back door when everybody else 
entered through the main entrance. And it was a very simple detail, and they told me why. But if you just think about it, there was no way that I should have been able to tell those two people or anybody else uh, who was there, eyes closed, no heartbeat, no pulse, laying underneath the truck, this much sticking out, right? I shouldn't have been able to tell them what door they came in, except that my true vantage point was in the ceiling. My spirit was in the ceiling watching from above. So uh, Leonard steps back. This woman gets down between the angels. She's feeling for a pulse. I remember there was a man on the passenger's front corner of the truck, a big guy in bibs. He had his arms crossed. He was talking to another guy. And she's feeling frantically feeling for a pulse because she's, it's a volunteer fire department. It's 2006. Their pagers went off. They showed up whenever they got there. Her and this other guy were the last two people to get there. So she's feeling for a pulse. I've been dead, depending on who you believe, six to eight to ten minutes at this point. That's, that's a very conservative range, six to eight to ten minutes. Somebody else said more, but that's the, the general consensus of the people who are there. So several minutes have gone by, no heartbeat, no pulse. Again, no CPR, no defibrillator, no nothing. Just stood back. And she's feeling for a pulse, and the guy who had his, in the bibs had his arms crossed, and he says to her, it's too late, he's dead. He's been dead for minutes, several minutes. He's, he's, it's too late. And she ignores him, and she just keeps feeling her own for a pulse, and he says it again, and she ignores him. And then she said, what's his name? And I don't know if she couldn't read the, my name on the patch in my uh, work uniform, but she says, what's his name? And, and Leonard says, Bruce Van Adam. Maybe she wanted my last name. So Leonard says, Bruce Van Adam. And this woman begins to slap me in the face and say, Bruce Van Adam, come back right now. Bruce Vanetta, open your eyes right now. And she began to get loud, and she's slapping my face. I'm up there not realizing that I'm Bruce Vanetta. I'm just up there having a good old time in the ceiling, watching everything play out below me. And she keeps getting louder and louder, and everybody stopped talking in the place. They, they're all polite, politely, quietly communicating, talking, whispering around the garage. But when she started doing it, she, they all stopped and looked at her like she was crazy. And she just kept getting louder and louder. And all of a sudden, my spirit slowly came out of the ceiling and it sped up. And the next thing I know, it came into my body. It seemed like through the head. And when my spirit came in the back of my body, again, now, think of this. No CPR, no shots, no nothing. This, this woman was praying. And when she was praying, my spirit comes back into my body and my heart started again. And now she can find a pulse right here. One spot, she said she couldn't find a pulse on my arms, no peripheral, but she found one spot that she could find a pulse. And she said it was a light pulse, but she could find it then. And my eyes popped open. When the pulse came, my eyes popped open, and I'm looking at her. And the very first thing that came to me was, oh, fertilizer, not the same word, but oh, fertilizer, I'm the guy underneath the truck. And it hurt so bad, I can't even tell you how bad it hurt. I mean, the pain, again, was off the charts. And so I go from feeling the best I've ever felt to feeling the worst I've ever felt. And I'm like, no way. I don't want this at all. I don't want this. And when I made the choice in my heart, in my spirit, soul, whatever, that no, I don't want to be alive. I don't want this. My heart stopped. My spirit left my body. I went right back up into the roof of the garage. And a tunnel opened up going out of the roof that was going up at an angle like this. And it seemed like it was probably a million miles long. And at the end of the tunnel was a very bright light. And I can tell you, I know that I know that I know that it was heaven on the end of the tunnel. And I was excited. I'm like, great, I'm going to go to heaven. And I got in the tunnel and I started going towards the bright light. And it seemed like I was going at a very fast uh, rate of speed. I, it felt fast. So I'm going in the tunnel towards the light very fast, excited to go to heaven. But I could hear her calling me from behind. I couldn't see anything in the garage anymore because I'm in the tunnel rocketing away towards heaven but I could hear her calling my name. And all of a sudden I stopped in the tunnel and I got sucked backwards to my dismay. I get sucked backwards out of the tunnel. Now I'm back in the roof of the garage. I'm looking down. There's the two angels. There's this red-haired lady. I can see her slapping my face and I come back and all of a sudden I'm back into my body. My eyes pop open. My heart starts. The, the one spot that the pulse comes back. And I had now been out of my body twice. I had seen the angels twice. So when I came back in my body this time, I was, I'm thinking about it, and I'm looking on my left, and I'm looking on my right for those two huge angels. But I couldn't see them with these eyes. But there was this incredible pain, and I remember just, you know, my eyes are closed because I'm wincing at the pain, and it's just, it's so bad. And right in that moment, in that chaos, in that fear, in that confusion, and that strife, that still small whisper spoke. And God simply said this. I didn't see anything. He just simply said, if you want to live, you're going to have to fight, and it's going to be a hard fight. And that's all he said. 
And I know that I know it was God, even though I didn't see him. And it took me like 2.2 seconds to think about it and say, no way. I don't want to fight. It hurts too bad. That felt way too good. And when I made that choice, for the third time, my heart stopped. My spirit left my body. I went up the roof of the garage. I got in the tunnel. And I was rocketing away towards the light, excited and happy to be going to heaven. But that persistent Christian woman was not going to give up. Not on her watch. It wasn't going to happen on her watch. So she's slapping my face and praying away. And I get sucked backwards out of the tunnel. I'm back in the roof of the garage. I'm going, oh, no. I didn't want to, but my spirit's coming back. And I go back into my body. And when my eyes popped open, she had actually later told us, because we get, get to spend time and meet her and her family, but she said the first two times, my eyes were completely closed. But she said the last time, she said my eyes only closed like halfway. When my heart stopped that third time, she said, my eyes had only closed like halfway, but they glazed over and they quit moving completely. And uh, she, when she prayed me back in that third time and my eyes opened up and I'm looking at her, she says to me, Mr., you're on the verge of life and death. And I'm thinking, lady, you have no idea what, what you're even saying. And she says, what do you have to fight for? Do you have a wife? Do you have kids? Do you have anything to fight for in this world? And I realized right in that moment that God was now, that still small whisper was now speaking through this woman to me to remind me that I was married. Because if, I was, if it was just about me, I was ready to go. There was no way I was going to fight. It hurt too bad and I was done. But God knew he used her to plant that seed and remind me that I was married, remind me that I had four small children and that I, could, I would and, and could fight for them even if I couldn't fight for myself. So she said, do not close your eyes, stay here. Stay here with me. Do not close your eyes. And so that ambulance came and picked me up, took me to the hospital, this local little podunk hospital where the helicopter came and picked me up and took, us, took me to our, our state's largest trauma center where the doctors, the emergency trauma doctors, it's a, it's a whole long thing, but the emergency trauma doctors uh, worked on my body and they um, called in the, the head trauma surgeon from home. He finished up the, the, the emergency operation my wife got there. They ended up putting in my body the number of units of blood. They told me it was three times the amount the body holds. And the point from the truck, from the point that the truck fell on me at approximately 6.15 p.m., it was over two hours before I was at that hospital and they were putting blood in me. I had five places that major arteries were completely severed. And the doctor said I should have bled out and died in roughly three to five minutes, which is exactly about the amount of time that it took for me to bleed out and die after they jacked the truck up off me. But after the lady prayed me back to life and whatever God was doing with those angels, over two hours stretches before they're putting blood in me at this trauma center and they're um, about to do emergency surgery, they rush me in and they do emergency surgery and the guy gets home, the two uh, guys that were started the operation and then they called in the other guy from home he comes in he finishes up the operation he comes out and tells my wife now again the picture this is the biggest trauma center in our state uh, he actually ended up coming after that and running the largest trauma center here in, in Denver and now he's down in, in the south running a large trauma center in the south of the United States but anyway he came out and told my wife that in all his years of being the head of a trauma department he had never in his life ever ever seen a body so physically traumatized, crushed, and destroyed, and make it to the hospital alive. And he said, your husband must have one hell of a will to fight, but I don't think he's going to be able to live through the hour. I don't expect him to live through the hour. Cross your ladies. Cross your fingers, lady, is what he said to my wife. And my wife said, I'm not going to cross my fingers. I'm going to pray. And so my wife and people from our church prayed, and because the doctor said I wasn't going to live an hour, they decided that they would pray every half an hour and thank God for every 30 minutes of life. So for the rest of the night, every 30 minutes I was alive, they thanked God for 30 more minutes of life. And the morning came, and my wife went to the doctors, and she said, you said everything's so badly destroyed, and all you did was hook up the arteries, and there's a lot more operations that need to be done. Are you going to do it or not? And they said, we didn't expect them to live. Let's give it a little bit. They still didn't. The next morning, they still don't think I'm going to live. And so they waited a little bit more. My wife just kept pestering and pestering. And finally, I don't know if she guilted them into it or, or how it happened, but they ended up, and they operated on and off all week long. Kept me in induced coma for several weeks. When I came out of the coma, I had a breathing tube in. I had a, a, a tube sewed into my nose and a breathing tube down my mouth. And I didn't know why I couldn't talk because, you know, they just brought me out of this, out of this coma. 
and I motioned for something to write with because I just wanted to write the word angel. When I was up in the ceiling, it didn't seem like a big deal at all. It seemed like so natural that those angels were down there to help that guy that turned out to be me. But as soon as I was back inside my body, it was a real big deal. And I just want to tell, the very first thing I wanted to tell everybody was God sent two angels. I saw these two huge angels, but I couldn't make the A come from here to here. It took me six months before I could read or write again. And uh, my wife said that I ended up throwing a fit and throwing the pen and, and, and uh, they, it's, it's, she said I ended up giving them some hand signals because they were laughing and, and trying to, you know, I was upset and they were trying to say why you're upset and because I couldn't communicate I got even more frustrated. But uh, when they finally did take the breathing tube out, I was able to tell them, and I remember my brother was there that day at the hospital and I was able to tell them, look, I saw these two huge angels and they were touching me right in the middle where I was crushed flat. And every nurse and every doctor, I just kept telling them, look, I saw these angels and the doctor, uh, the, we found out later they actually called him a uh, medical genius. When the President of the United States would come to the state, he was a doctor they would put on call in case anything would happen to the President. So he's like the best of the best kind of doctor. He was an atheist, and I remember telling him the first time when I could talk to him about the angels, and I remember the look of uh, um, just, it was, it was clear that he didn't believe me. It was, it was clear that he didn't believe me. He studied my case for a year. It's a university hospital. He studied my case for a year, and he told me, uh, once I got a little bit better, I ended up staying in that hospital. I was in the hospital for over one year. And they would let me out for a couple weeks, but I'd go back. But when we added up the days, I spent over a year in the hospital. So I remember him uh, saying that, he said, we're going to study your case and, and figure out why you lived with all those arteries severed so that we can then use that information to save people with severed arteries around the world. And after a year, I remember the day that he called me. He wouldn't do it in person. But he called me and he said, we're done. We're not going to study the case anymore. We've been studying every day for a year. And he said, we're not going to look at it anymore. We're, we're done. He said, there is no logical reason for you to be alive. There, there's no way you should have ever made it. You should have never made it to the hospital. You should have been dead a long time before you ever got there. And uh, when History Channel did my story, uh, Discovery Channel did it in History Channel, and all the major Christian television shows have all done it, and there's been like five reenactments of it in Hollywood. And, but when History Channel did it, they tried to disprove it and say it wasn't real in a show called Miracles Decoded, and there was 24 miracles they tried to disprove. And I was saved for the, my story was saved for the last episode, episode number eight. And it was the only one out of 24 that they had to admit that the, there was two huge miracles. And so the second miracle is this. Adults have 18 to 20 some feet, depending on, you know, that's the average, 18 to 22, 18 to 24 feet length of small intestine. And guess where it is? Right below your belly button, right where I was crushed in half. So all my it, small intestine was completely destroyed. They had to remove it all. It's all in pathology reports, except for two pieces they were able to save that was a little bit over two feet. And then one of those pieces died that it, they tried to save. One of those pieces died, and now I'm a little bit under two feet. And it wasn't able to live on, on that. I couldn't eat. So they're feeding me intravenously. We found out at, at a certain point in the hospital, uh, I remember the day very well, the, the doctor came in, one of the doctors came in. And I was, uh, because I'm type A type, can't hold still, can't take a vacation, kind of wound real tight guy, I was going stir crazy in this hospital. I mean, it was like... I was going nuts. And I said, you got to let me out of here. I can't stay here. You have to let me out of this hospital. And I got in a fight with the doctor, argument. And this, this, it was a female doctor, and she said, um, I said, you can't keep me here forever. And she said, Mr. Veneta, we're not going to keep you here forever. And I said, well, when do I get to go home? She said, you're not going to go home. We're only going to be able to keep you alive for at the most six months to maybe at the very, very most a year because every day you're losing weight. I'd lost 65 pounds at that point. I looked like somebody straight out of a concentration camp. And she said, you're going to starve to death here in the hospital because of all your injuries. And the, she said, we can't keep you alive probably any more than six months to a year. And again, I, I got an argument with her and kicked her out of the room. And my wife had me on prayer chains. She worked at a church, and she had me on prayer chains on churches. People, we got letters from around the country. People are praying for month after month after month after month. And it started being on different national uh, news things. And, you know, other people heard about the story. And it was on the front page of newspapers and different things. And uh, she, uh, she has people praying for me all over. And this guy in New York said that God woke him up two mornings in a row at 5 a.m. and told him, buy a plane ticket. 
fly to Wisconsin and pray for this guy in the hospital that you're praying for in your church because I was on the prayer chain at their church. And Wisconsin's, you know, a long ways away from New York. And this guy, the first day he blew it off, the second day he was obedient to God, he did it, bought a short-term right now ticket. It cost him over $900, almost $1,000 actually. And he flew to Wisconsin, got a ride there from the airport to the hospital, prayed for me in the hospital. And when he did, he prayed for me and I literally felt the power of God come out of his palm of his hand when he put it on my forehead. And it felt like I touched an electric fence. It actually stung. And the power of God came in, out of his palm, into my body, and I felt my intestines coming back. CAT scans, x-rays, upper GIs, multiple radiological tests prove that instantaneously, right on the spot, God gave me back one half. So nine, they won't say exactly because the exact verbiage was the small intestine is too circuitous. In other words, it's a ball of worms. It's all wrapped up. And so we can't tell you exactly for sure, but we, we're going to say we can tell you've got at least one half of your intestines back. So 9 to 11 feet of intestines came back out of nowhere instantaneously when this guy prayed, and I felt it come back. I felt it come back, and it's the only reason why I'm alive to share this testimony with you, or I would have starved to death and I would have died, you know, six months, a year at the most after that. Psalm 91 says, again, that he who dwells he who abides, who, he who chooses to stay in God's presence. And then God is a refuge. Then God is a fortress. Then God is the one we can trust. He's the one who saves us from evil people and evil things. He covers and protects us. We don't have to fear danger. We don't have to fear pestilence, disease. We don't have to fear any of that stuff. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not a perfect guy. And I wasn't a perfect guy then. I wasn't, you know, uh, what somebody... I have to say this, I, I minister, uh, I do this, we, we spoke twice this weekend, we flew in Saturday, spoke twice at a couple different churches yesterday, drove over here to, to do the conference, and um, every time I get introduced and somebody says, you know, because I've maybe been there in the past or something, and somebody says, oh, uh, today we have a you know, great man of God or this righteous man of God, I wince because I think, oh, you don't, you don't know me. I'm, I'm not a great man of God. I'm not a righteous man. I'm just a normal everyday sinner, just a normal guy like everybody else. I'm definitely, in fact, I'm probably worse than a lot of people, most people. And yet God sent angels for me. And yet God sent a lady to pray me back to life. And yet God sent this guy from across the United States to pray and a creative miracle happens where my intestines come back to the point where I could live. Some people said, well, why didn't God give you all your intestines back? If he was going to do a creative miracle, why didn't you get them all back? And I think we've come up with the reason. We came up with it right away. Uh, the muscles were so completely destroyed that as soon as that miracle happened and I got half my intestines back, my stomach looked like a sack of potatoes because I had so many hernias. The hernias were sticking out all over. It literally stuck out. All the balls of small intestine were, were they looked like soft, like the size of a softball sticking out all over my belly, and that was only half my intestines back. So one of the surgeries later then, they put a net in here to cover like 75% of it, and they left 25% open for later surgeries. And so uh, that's why it, it kind of looks normal, but it kind of doesn't. And uh, I just want to encourage you. I mean, you're here. If you were really scared, you wouldn't have come. This was originally supposed to be 350-some people over, over that. And I don't know what we're here tonight. I can't quite see um, 50, 60, 70. I'm not sure what's here, but it's a, it's a long shot from 350. But I know this, every person that's here was meant to be here. For, for some reason, we're meant to be here. I know uh, when uh, Jane and I and, and uh, Jeremy and me and my wife, we were praying about this, we we're, you know, thinking about this. There is a strategic, specific reason why this meeting is still going. It's not happenstance, it's not coincidence, and it's definitely not bad planning. There's a spiritual reason why we're here tonight and, and tomorrow and whenever, however long this is going to be. And you know what? We, Christians, we have got to be the light. We have got to be the, the, the hope. We've, we've got to be the ones that are Jesus' hands and feet. You know, this spot in Psalm 91 later on when it gets to verse like 10, 11, and 12, when Jesus was being tempted in the desert, the devil quoted these verses from this chapter of the, of the Bible. 
The devil quoted these verses to him, and he, the devil took him and put him on top of the temple and said, go ahead and jump down because God is going to send an angel to protect you. And he quotes these verses. And Jesus basically calls him on and says, it is written, and then says, don't tempt the Lord your God. And even though the Bible, this spot, 91, says that, uh, you know, that God is going to send the angels to protect us, and I saw two angels that God sent to help me, right? I saw them. They're real. God is real. Angels are real. This stuff is real. But Jesus, when he responded to the devil and he said, don't tempt the Lord your God, what it means is, I think we can apply it to this, what's going on, the, the craziness that we're seeing right now. It means that, you know, we're not going to take unnecessary chances. We're not going to do things that is, you know, crazy. But we also don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid. And I honestly don't think that coming here was, a, was a, any more of a chance than going to Walmart and trying to find wall, toilet paper, right? Come on, right? We're, we're a lot safer here tonight than you're in Walmart, right? And, uh, or in the airplane or any, anywhere else, I don't know. I mean, we're here for a reason. God is the one who is our refuge. He's our fortress, and it's all because of amazing love for us. That's what it all comes down to. I'm, I'm amazed at his overwhelming love for us. He's a faithful God. He's a trustworthy God, even when we're not. Even when I'm not, even when you're not. When our spouses aren't and our kids aren't and you know, the pastor that fails or the, the worship leader that fails, even when we're not faithful, even when we're not trustworthy, God is always faithful. And I just, you know, I just want you to remember this. Galatians, in Galatians, it says that God is speaking, and he says this. He says, do I send the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you follow the law? In other words, because you're righteous, because you're a perfect person, or because you believe what you've heard of who he is? It's not because we're perfect that we can trust him to be a refuge. It's not because of us that we can, as it says in uh, the Hebrews, where it says that we can approach the throne of grace with boldness, with confidence. I'll tell you what, when I pray, my boldness and my confidence is not about me or my prayers or anything about this guy, and it's definitely not about my righteousness. It's about the finished work of the cross. Jesus died. Three days later, he rose again, and when he did, he conquered sin, death, sickness, and the devil, and that includes the corona, right? He, he conquered it all. It's all underneath his feet. And uh, we don't have to take unnecessary chances, but we also do not have to be afraid. And you and I, those are here tonight that are believers, you and I get to be Jesus' hands and feet, and we get to be the people that share this truth and share this hope. And it says that hope is an anchor for our soul. And we can share the hope. We don't have to share fear. We don't have to, uh, to share hysteria. We get to share hope of a God who is always faithful, who is always loving, who is always kind. Amen? Amen. So that's what I'm going to encourage you. I mean, that's it. I mean, I know this, this, this conference has changed what we thought it was going to look like. It's, it's morphed multiple times. As being one of the speakers, I've watched the schedule change a couple different times about when I was going to speak. But it doesn't matter. God's will is being done. We're here for a reason, and we know that God is faithful. Amen? God bless you, and have an awesome week.